a talent leader needs to be a business leader. First or second person you need to hire in a recruitment team is an employer branding manager. A lot of people don't do that. Yeah, a lot of the people are building up huge recruitment teams, but have a shitty employer brand. And that is scaling bullshit. What do companies need to do to successfully hire and scale in what is right now the most competitive market for talent we have ever seen? Well, luckily, Matthias Smeiser has the answer to just that. And I was delighted to have him on the podcast today. He is a talent acquisition expert and thought leader currently scaling Beamery in Berlin. But his journey to the top of the talent game was super interesting as well. He originally studied political economics at university before going into the recruitment agency world. From there, he went back to education to study human resources management. And after that, rose the ranks quickly in talent acquisition holding a series of high-level positions at the likes of Zalando and Scout24 before moving to Beamery earlier this year. I know I'm going to say this, but genuinely, if you are in talent acquisition, just trying to make a couple of hires or even scaling an entire organisation, then this is the episode for you. Matthias is clearly a forward thinker, implementing new ideas and strategies wherever he has gone, and he shares that with us today. We go over things like how to actually assemble your talent team, employer branding, why diversity should be at the centre of everything you do, and so much more as well. I got so much value from speaking with him, and I know that if you are in the TA world, you will get some from this too. So without further ado, I'm Alex Bloisey, and this is the Building Our World podcast. How did you get into talent acquisition in the first place? And talk us through how you got to where you are today in the position you're in. Yeah, uh, more than happy to. Um, so how do I get into TA? I think um, I started um, really when I uh, finished my bachelor studies in political economics. And um, at that time, didn't know very much about the business and, and jobs and how the world uh, looks out there, especially talent markets and how you do recruiting. And I started with, um, as a lot of people do, with agency recruiting um, and um, really went for an internship to just understand like what recruiters do, um, how do you work with candidates together. And um, it was very interesting because it closes the loop to Beamer very well because uh, at that time I was working in interim management, um, did, it, did some interviews there and literally worked on, on a talent pool, yeah, which we call these days a talent pool. Um, and um, a database just, you know, looked at who can came came in, and um, also the people that had uh, somehow a short projects um, from three to six months, and that was very interesting and intrigued me because I was listening all the time to very experienced people in the industry who then uh, became self-employed and worked on change management projects, yeah, or improvements uh, for certain um, departments. Um, after that, I wanted to go back um, to the university um, to finish uh, my master because my parents uh, were on my back uh, and said, Matthias, bachelor is not enough. You need to get a proper education, um, which uh, it's very good. Like looking back again, this master didn't help me at all. But at that time, we said, OK, maybe a proper education in human resource management is um, ideal. And so I studied for um, almost two years. Um, um, studied um, human resource management and try to get a little bit of a better understanding around how does um, 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 diagnostics work, how does people development work, how does um, you know business administration work, um, and and really also focused on labor law, especially German labor law. So we're sitting with those lawyers together and um, studied that and try to get a little bit of a sense of you know how does law work, uh, especially in the labor labor context and that kind of rounded up my profile and then when i wanted to come back um, i really then figured out okay where can i find a job and really started with a recruiting job in, in startups and made my first startup experience and it was the first lessons learned actually where i went into a job where i had my first 15 minutes interview 
And I really figured out very early on, they don't know what they are talking about, but they invited me for the next round. And I said, okay, my gut feeling says no, but if they like me, I'm going to go ahead. Um, afterwards, it turned out it was the worst decision I ever made in my life, uh, in my first job. And um, it told me this experience around, you know, you should listen to uh, to your, your gut feeling. Maybe sometimes if you feel like, you know, that's not flying, don't get yourself like sold into something. And then when I really learned from that experience, which is sometimes good, to then really continue the same approach one more time in an organization that had more empathy around what I do. And then I could start learning a little bit more around how can you scale um, tech recruiting? How can you scale organizations? At that time, I worked with a um, system called Jobwhite, which was a hot thing at the market at that time because you could track applications, you know and understand where they're coming from. And that uh, we took that for an advantage to really um, you know, work with our channels a bit better. And from that point of time, I literally was just headhunted the whole time. Um, like when people ask me for my CV, I would even have a hard time to get that up and updated and up and running. And so I really went from working at Zalando, which is a global enterprise company, at Scout24, which is a bigger enterprise company, and then really um, ended up at Beamery, where I made use of my experience being a client myself from Beamery, but also have had experience at Scout, the recent sales experience, how the Beamery sells the product. And then when they reached out to me and said, can you help us to scale the organization? I was like, totally believe in what you're doing and how you shape the and disrupt the business. So yeah, let me help you there. Wow, what a career. You've risen quickly through the ranks in talent acquisition. What would you say has been the biggest change from being a TA person to being a TA leader? Someone who is now in charge of scaling an organization, maybe someone who's now less hands on and more hands off and has to see the bigger picture. Um, yeah, um, what is very important when, when you, you become a leader um, over that certain period of time in your career that you will work uh, a lot with data. Yeah, um, even sometimes um, I've seen this that 50% of my time is just pulling data, um, um, trying to make it uh, adjust data, um, add value from it, uh, build up uh, uh, and build data-driven stories, make recommendations, make predictions, and uh, you know make sure we're making the right decisions in, in, in our area, um, and also see that you know what works, what not, uh, where can we you know learn from. Um, and that's literally something that, uh, you know, is a part of the game at the minute. Yeah? And it's something that is something I do on an everyday basis. You say you're very data driven and analytical in your approach. How hard was that to implement with like people in your talent team? Because this, most recruiters or people in talent acquisition, they're very salesy um, people, 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 I suppose they yeah. don't really crunch numbers and crunch data like with myself especially when i first started in recruitment i wasn't really interested in data um i've learned to like it now because i i know what it can do and, and how mm. successful it can be so has that always come naturally to you and did you have any sort of troubles implementing those sorts of strategies yeah so i think that the interest here comes from i, I tried back in the days where i didn't know what to figure out what to study I, I started uh, mathematics actually, and, and and higher mathematics and education. So I had always um, naturally drawn a topic or an interest in numbers. But really, when I was as a recruiter and when I came in there, I think what I learned back then and something I would encourage, uh, especially young recruiters, to do most of the time is I was in an, a classified business, in a performance marketing business where conversion rates, where, um, where are our channels, how are they working out, was their daily in and out business. So if you start working with those people together and try to learn what they do in terms of optimizing success and um, having business impact, you can learn a very much, a very much uh, from, uh, from your own practices. And this is how I, how I did this. So um, I was then really in this era of like, um, okay, we have an ATS. We know where our candidates come from. So how do we optimize this? How do we make it work? When do we, when do we start you know, putting money into channels? Do we see a success there? A look at conversions. How do we break this down, right? And I think um, especially one of my former leaders who was um, an interim leader, 
back then um, at Zalando, but he had a Google um, history for five years, worked at Google, has seen it all. He said, when you just look every week on your numbers, on your funnel, on your pipeline and try to optimize accordingly, you will be very successful. Yeah, it's a numbers game. And um, the more you mature in your career, the more you will see if you have the right numbers in place, also executives will listen to you. Also the people that say, okay, is it like 50 or 100K? Well, show me the numbers. Okay, that makes sense. Okay, let's do it, right? And that is where you add value because I think we are in a space where there is still a lot of opinionated conversations, a lot of like, oh, this is a gut feeling. Oh, the weather you know, is bad. That's why recruiting sucks, right? So literally what I'm, what I'm trying to say here is the more data you bring to the table, the more you get taken seriously and the more you can have impact and also show what works, right? So and so many times people don't know. It's a black box for them. They don't have a clue. And if you are capable to show the right data to the right people and then explain and have a storytelling approach around it, this is where you can succeed or will succeed. Okay. Can you, can you think of any examples where you've um, taken some data, you had the data points, and it's just you've gone, you've analyzed it, you've presented it, and you thought, wow, this has really yeah. helped us and it's going to help us. And is there anything that other people could, could take away from that? Yeah, no, 100%. I mean, for example, what we did within with Joppa back then, very, very fast example, but I still have this so much in my mind. It's like we did a referral um, uh, competition um, with, uh, with the business and said, you know what, we have hard to fill roles here. Um, here are the tracking links. Please share it in your networks. Um, and somebody managed and we looked at the reporting. We, we, the competition took like three or four weeks. And then we saw somebody you know, who created the most leads and who actually were successful and we really hired someone. And there was someone, because back then it was a classified in Berlin means that we needed to hire a Brazilian um, candidate for the Brazilian market that is located in Berlin. So it's not so easy to find. Um, and somebody created like 50 applications and we hired in the end one person. And we were like, what are you doing? Where did you put this? And I mean, as I said, right, it was a performance marketing company. So what they did, they put this in one of the Facebook groups, shared it, and a lot of people applied there. And it really worked. So that opened my eyes in terms of, you know, we're always thinking job boards. We're always thinking like, okay, free job boards, paid job boards. What is it? But literally, it's the communities, the groups that are actually much more powerful than anything else. So that, that was one key takeaway. If I can take another is... Think about when you have the funnel over the year and you see how much interviews do we do? Yeah, first round, second round, third round, however, how many steps you have. And then really calculate of like, if I can give the CTO, the CMO, this, you know, CCO, whatever it is, so and so many hours time back, if we implement a tool or if we change a certain mechanism within the system, then they are listening, right? If I, for example, at that use case that I had with Scout, I said, I can give you 800 hours of your engineer time back for product development. Are you interested to hear me out? Um, and are you willing to invest for like 20K? Et voila, yeah, 800 hours is a lot. Huh? Yeah, awesome. I, I wanted to bring it now to present day. Uh, you joined Beamery at the start of the year. Um, I know they're pretty much i think they're, they're headquartered in london is that right um yeah. and recently announced that they are building a uh, berlin hub uh, which makes sense why you joined there <laughs> um, if there's anyone who's gonna take care of that it's gonna be you so obviously 2021 for berlin tech hiring tech hiring globally has been off the chart completely unexpected like the snapback from covid has been crazy Everyone's going through the same pains. You are now tasked with building this hub in the toughest, most competitive market. Um, and I really want to dig into different aspects of that. But the first thing I wanted to, to put across is I'm guessing you're assembling your own talent team. And I want to see not so much how you're going about it, but how do you know how many people you need uh, in your talent team? Uh, and then how are you finding these people? Because everyone I speak to, all my clients are like, 
okay, we need talent. We actually need talent acquisition managers. The amount of times my clients try to poach me because they just <laughs> run out of ideas. Um, so I'd love to get your your insights into how you're building the talent team to take on this this huge challenge. Oh yeah, I love that question already, Alex. Um, so here's the here's the deal. I think um, it's a very important question, and I think a lot of people do it wrong. Um, what how I built this is pretty much. Let's start off with this sentence of saying a talent leader needs to be a business leader. Why do I say that? Is because everything that I built, everything that I built needs to be sustainable and needs to make sense. So, for example, over hiring my team, just because we have a hiring problem for the next three months or six months, um, and then letting people go after a year or a year and a half, just because I did, didn't do the math correctly, is, is actually unhealthy, right? So what we are doing at the minute, and that's a common sense scenario, but there's a lot of talks in the global talent scene around it, is like when you ask, what is the optimal rec load of a recruiter? Um, a lot of people would probably say it depends, right? And it's it's true. Mm -hmm. The answer is it depends. But in the end of the day, it's like um, you need to understand what kind of organization you have, what kind of auditing are you doing, yeah? So you need to understand how is your employer brand, yeah? You need to understand, you know, how much do we need to hire? What is the hiring need? You need to understand how are we retaining people? So how much backfill is there or not, Right. And then you need to understand what is the situation? What is the situation within? A lot of people uh, don't do that because what I mean with the situation in, in, um, within is what are the career paths for those people that come in, right? What kind of hiring managers do they have in front of us? Yeah, so it could be very particular based on that different department, very strong leaders, very opinionated leaders, very demanding, but still very collaborative leaders. It really, really depends what kind of situation you have there. And if you then, based on that audit and that assessment that you do, then hire the right people in, do you have certain different profiles? Because in the end of the day, you might have someone who's super strong with managing up, with leading leaders, with senior stakeholder management, and doesn't doesn't need to be the best sorcerer in the world. But if he has handled that noise internally, he will be successful, more successful when you then look at, you know, other functions. So, but I now want to, uh, you know, really talk about the structure mm -hmm. of it. Yeah. So I think what you really need to do is, and especially we did this at Beamery and I'm very happy about it is from day one on the first or second person you need to hire in a recruitment team is an employer branding manager. A lot of people don't do that. Yeah. A lot of the mm -hmm. people are building up huge recruitment teams but have a shitty employer brand and that is scaling bullshit. Sorry for that. Right. But I think it is definitely something where you need to work on that and get an understanding. This is a brand awareness, especially for tech organizations, startups, scale-ups. It's a brand awareness challenge as well as it is a talent marketing or recruitment marketing um, a, um, a challenge where you build leads for your recruiters. Right. Because what you optimize in the very beginning is increasing the response rates of in-mails based on the brand awareness and the recruitment marketing that you create. So if you don't do that from the very beginning, you're set up on a wrong track. Another thing that I would highly recommend, and it's a well-read concept around the world, but especially in Berlin, I haven't seen so many people, a couple of do it, but not so many people do it, is talent ops. So this whole op topic around you see this in product organizations, you see this in design organizations as well, engineers as well, you know, dev, DevOps, um, uh, platform SREs, um, especially design ops and, and product ops is also very common. But what they have in mind is, to be really back to the basics is, I need somebody in the team that actually cares about the productivity of my recruiters. And why I say that is this mindset of what kind of tooling do we need to be successful? And if you don't have a person that works 24-7 on that topic of how do I optimize the productivity of my recruiters, I think you set up for failure as well. Because at the minute, and we are not talking about headcount yet, we are just talking about mm. what kind of people I need in my team. Yeah, This is something that is key because technology 
will help you. Will help you to automate administrative topics. Will help you to be faster in what you do in terms of sourcing approaches, and can even help you with a certain assessment support. I'm not saying they make the decisions for you, but they support you in your assessment that will help you to you know be better and give you more data points. And so all of that, I think, is something that you need to think about. Now I come up back to your original question: How do you build your team, and how many people do you need? <coughs> I think you need to separate this between seniority levels, junior, mid-level, senior, and then talent leads. Um, and there, you would probably say, given of the environment that could differ, I would expect the junior recruiter to deliver between 30 to 40 roles, um, hires, sorry, hires per year. Um, I would go for a, a mid-level recruiter with 40 to 50 hires and a senior with 50 to 60 or, or even on top 70 and then the talent leads, and don't make this mistake, they also can be hands-on and operate and hire, but they shouldn't have those same numbers because what mm. their focus is, is actually to empower, to grow, to lead people, right? Um, and probably have the senior um, leadership in place. So all in all, this is how I would set it up. These are the criteria I would look at, and these are the numbers that roughly I would put in place. But of course... Don't quote me on that because that's maybe now the Beamery situation. It could look like for a more established organization that has a strong employer brand, that has already a, a bigger team, completely different when it comes to hires versus um, mm. our recruiters there. Yeah, um, But that's how I would build it. Absolutely. Wow. Well, there you have it. Uh, I completely agree in terms of your employer brand approach first because the thing that takes the longest is brand. Uh, when I started my business last year, I knew that you have to start the branding from day one, the marketing, the content, because um, it's an engine, isn't it? It's an engine. You can't stop and start it. It's an engine that has to run and it has to run for you um, all the time. And that work you do now, you get recruiters or talent people coming into your team. It just makes their job so much easier. And uh, yeah, you're quite right about talent leads needing to be... Um, fairly hands-off i have the same um, debates with people about engineering managers in tech yeah. there's that sort of analogy it's an analogy i heard the other day and um i keep using it because i think it's so great it's just uh, you can't see the whole chessboard if you're one of the pieces yeah uh, you have to be you have to be above it and um and i think there's an element of of trust as well within within your team mm -hmm. too that's that's needed and um if you think about it like that also the talent leaders should be the one because you asked also the other question around, you know, how do you find recruiters, right? How do you hire them, right? That's that's a big problem. And one of the things is what I've seen, especially in the situation we are in right now, if you have a personal brand, if you have a certain community behind you, and those leaders would have that as well, these are the ones that are recruiting for their teams. So you need to look at like how established someone is and don't only just look at, Hmm, you know what, can they do the job? Have they had a lot of experience? It's more about, are they pretty vocal in the community? You know, what do they stand for? What kind of talks they give? Are they inspiring? Would other people follow them? Because they believe if I'm, you know, working under Matthias for two years, I can learn a thing or two. That's more exciting than going somewhere else where I get more money, but don't learn yeah. a thing, right? And I think um, this brings me back to the overall situation of the talent market. I think, a lot of people are so much driven by salary and joining for the wrong reasons in the organization, which I don't think is healthy and sustainable. Yes, it is good to make, you know, maybe on a short term to double their salary or, you know, get a little bit of a boost. But on a long term um, perspective, I think, you know, what always people told me in my career is don't look so much on the money. Look and look at what you can learn and what you can get with. And I think the Zalando example is great because um, there was a time where at Zalando, literally everybody was like, recruiter at Zalando, you can walk over water, right? Because literally everybody would say, you understand how you scale, you don't understand how hypergrowth works, so we'll hi hire you blindly. But actually, that is so wrong, right? Because it's literally saying, or it's very biased to say, oh, you worked at Google or Facebook, you must be great, right? You, you, you are the best. And so, so many times we know that's not the case, right? Um, so a little hint for people who look for recruiters, 
Don't look at the big names. Look at the little names that still manage and do that job very well with having no brand at all because they do a much better and a much harder job than all on the big ones that have that brand and that have that certain technology because that is then also a challenge but not as of a challenge as they would have uh, if they wouldn't have all of those goodies yeah, that we talked about. Mm. So have you started to um, add people into your team now? How, how's that looking? Is it like an ongoing process? Yeah, it's an ongoing process, but I have to say, and, and that's probably me, I don't know, but um, I actually find it not that difficult. Um, uh, I have good conversations um, and I have to say what is for me maybe also something that not so many people think about is I always try to put the resume away. You know, I look at the resume, say, yeah, could we talk to them? Yeah, looks interesting. But then I completely dismiss that resume and only look at the conversations I have with people. And you will figure out if you do ask the right questions, how many transferable skills do people have to actually do that job, right? And I think we... Uh, don't do this very often that we hire completely different profiles into our teams, whereas the complexity that we have, that we are confronted with, actually needs that different skill set, that different profile, that different perspective. And if we don't do that, we are actually starting, for example, the diversity topic is very interesting. We are confronted to hire diverse people, diversify organizations, but how diverse is our talent team most of the time? It's not diverse, right? So we already fail by our own team to diversify our own team. And therefore, and when I say diversify, I mean all different topics, age, you know, ethnicity, um, um, uh, gender, you know, there are so many more disabilities. I think you can really, if you do this very well, you can, a diverse team is always harder to work with but it's more effective and more successful, right? When it comes to the knowledge work that we need to do in, um, uh, as recruiters these days. So I, I think, you know, when you really want to take this seriously, you as a talent leader should start um, by leading by example and start diversify your team from the very beginning. Absolutely. I couldn't agree with you more on that. Is there any strategies you have in place or any practical things you have in place that allows you to recruit diverse candidates yeah i think um one of the things that a lot of people forget start with processes and consistent assessment yeah i think um how many times have we seen it and we all know it we all have been there right oh this is the referral of the cpo or the ceo yes he doesn't need to do all of the interviews, just set him up with a hiring manager, have a coffee chat, and then suddenly that person is hired. And suddenly, you know, oh, that's the white classical male with the higher education access, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think by by now, by all, 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 all fairness, I have to say in every organization I have been there, I have seen such shortcuts. So um, it starts with really, you know, in the end of the day as an assessment process, it's literally what I always say, if you think about talent acquisition or your practices as a product, it's all about this uh, information architecture that you have around you. And it starts with content. That's like the employer branding side, but it's also starting with assessment practices, right? Um, and here really to understand how can you fairly and consistently ask the same questions in the same order and really make this an appealing and a fair uh, process is the first start to get, you know, a, a fair playground. Then the second one is really how transparent am I in front of candidates to level the, the, the playground in terms of, oh, you know, my hiring manager has all of those interview guidelines but the candidate doesn't know anything about this interview, right? So how much are you transparent around, this is our assessment approach, this is what happens in the first round, this is what happens in the second round. A lot of people don't do this, um, and that literally puts them, those ta candidates in general, but especially diverse talents, um, uh, in, a, in a bad position because you already discriminate them because the one has more information than the other, and therefore, it's literally like a power play scenario. And then last but not least, I think coming back to um, employer branding is how per default, I think it's super interesting with this DNI approach is 
we are talking about it, but actually per definition, everything we do should be, you know, DNI ready. So um, there should be different people in pictures. The, 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 the language should be more inclusive. Um, the practices, everything we do should be actually already best practices. Because then if that is happening, we don't talk about DNI anymore. We talk about everybody gets a fair yeah. chance, and if it's you can the default, this, default exactly. setting, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And um, and it actually is that weak spot where we say, well, for the first time because of DNI, we are getting into our processes that are set up uh, for failure, that are broken, that are not actually adding value. And you can clearly see in Berlin, especially, it's also a topic in Berlin. It's like, don't believe this is the most diverse place and the most diverse hiring um, 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 space that you have seen before. Yeah, Berlin itself as a city is very diverse, but the organizations aren't, right? Especially director level, team lead level, um, C level. There are lots of, lots of white male uh, boys club that actually is running those very successful companies, right? Sometimes. And you need yeah. to be aware of that. And I think sometimes we forget because we see on the street a very diverse, colorful, you know, uh, people and believe that everything is exactly the same. But it, it really literally starts with, oh, you don't know the market or oh, you're relocating here. Hmm, I don't know. I don't know if I can hire you or, you know, especially with talent teams or HR teams. Oh, you don't know labor law, the German labor law. Oh, well, then mm, I don't know. Right. Um, and so I think, you know, last tip from my side, also look at um, language, right? So um, if there's a German ad out there and you are forced to talk in German in a German company, well, then it's probably as an international, not the best place to go here and be there because everything will be in German. Every documentation will be in German. So really look at like, what is their culture? Are they talking English? Do they have to talk English or is this per, per default? And I think a lot of scale-ups, especially like Salando, for example, this was all of per default, right? And I really love the, love the way of saying when you and me would be in a meeting room, we would talk English. If I have a German colleague coming in, you are not being in the meeting room. I'm just alone with my German colleague. Of course, we can then talk German, right? But in the end of the day, always being yeah. aware that we use the right language for the right people are in the room. And so many people and organizations get this wrong. Paris, Berlin, other people, they suddenly switch to French, they suddenly stay in German, and it's very exclusive. Yeah. One big thing, obviously, I recruit software engineers, and if I speak to someone from a company in Berlin, there's quite a few times where they've just said, company's great, culture's great, but in my specific team, there's you know four people of the same nationality, uh, and they obviously all speak in their, in their native language and kind of just feel a bit left out. Even if yeah. it's just like just leaning over your desk and, and asking for something um, or just saying one thing, it, it can make a huge impact and really exclude people very quickly. Yeah, 100%. And then look at interview panels, right? Yeah. How, how non-diverse are interview panels these days? It's a mess. It's a mess, yeah. right? Um, so it really, really starts um, from, you know, setting everything up for success by understanding who is interviewing whom and in which way, and, you know, have that processes in place. Um, because when you bring diverse talents in and you don't get that, get this all taken care of, you will already lose them in the, in the process, right? Mm. Mm, absolutely. Interesting what you say about sea level when I started this podcast. So originally I just wanted to yeah. speak to founders because yeah. I just started my business and just wanted to steal some knowledge really. Yeah. Um, and had some great conversations, really great, amazing people done great stuff. Um, but it got to like episode six and I was like, I have spoken to a white male in their thirties or forties for the past six weeks. I need to probably mix it up. <laughs> yeah. hundred percent. hundred percent. And I mean, look at us, right? I think in uh, the end of the day, um, what I take, if you are aware of what I learned as well, if you are aware of your privileges, of your privileges that you have earned, that's mm. the first step, or you didn't earn. Yeah, Privileges are always not earned, right? Yeah. They are just given based on, on, on where you have grown into. But then if you are aware of this, this is the first step. And then the second step is really, you know, how do we make sure 
that um, we as white men drive diversity forward, right? Because it shouldn't only be the people that are diverse to drive diversity forward. It should also be us who are encouraging that, right? 100%, yeah. And, and I think so and so many times, I mean, there's an interesting uh, theory. I don't know if you've heard of it. It's not probably not even a theory. It's, it's, it's practice, but I wouldn't call the study yet uh, from the top of my head. But they're saying this topic around everybody is, especially in Berlin, gender diversity. Gender diversity is big, you know. Sometimes it's even so noisy that people believe that gender diversity is diversity, which it's not, right? But a lot of people believe if I have female leaders in my organization, they will help to encourage other female um, colleagues um, to grow as well. But studies have shown that's not the case, Right. Um, and I th don't think a lot of people are aware of that because they believe the more and more I increase my female leadership in an organization, I will help women per default in that organization. But that's not happening. And the reason why that is, I think, is, you know, those women have learned to see these elite structures and learn from them and adjust it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And therefore adapt the same behaviors that made them successful because in the end we are human beings, right? We adjust yeah. to our culture, our society. And then based on that, we adapt because that helped us there. And now to really then change that mentality is also something that I would say everyone should question yourself, diverse or non-diverse, how inclusive their practices are, right? Because so and so many times this is like, per default in our bias to say, no, it oh, makes yeah, sense. 100%. Women leaders, you know, and then a lot of more women. Yeah, sure. Let's do that. Right. Um, and um, yeah, decision making is uh, probably also another topic where you can talk about ours around how we as human beings make decisions based on emotions, you know, facts, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, it, it really is a fascinating topic and it's, it's a topic that a lot of people didn't even know existed. It just opens up a whole yeah, host of things and you question everything and you see things so differently and rightly so as well um i do yeah. think on the whole like berlin tech is pretty advanced in in that field in terms of practices i think tech in general is mm -hmm. quite progressive yeah uh, there's still obviously a, a hell of a lot to to go um cool so coming coming back to to beamery um and and looking ahead in terms of like your your head counts, then have you now started to basically assign you know how many roles each recruiter is working on? You've got the sort of branding in place, the diversity stuff as default as you can. So once you have all that in place, is it just a case of you know just recruiting like in the conventional sense? Um, I hope not. Um, I think. There are a couple of things that, you know, given our, our Beamery product, right, which is um, um, literally a sourcing tool, um, especially mm. for sourcers, this makes more sense than maybe for recruiters. But let's let's keep that away. I think it, the whole concept is around building communities, building pools and leverage them, uh, leverage them over a certain period of time, have um, nurturing and engagement strategies to use those pooling and then bring them uh, along. And um if you think about that, I think um, I think that's the way going forward. So that means that, of course, with our brand awareness that it will increase, um, we will get inbound candidates, right? And we will also source candidates still. But I think what really, really matters is um, the community approach. Uh, and the community approach in terms of, um, and that's also, by the way, an employer branding task, is like, how do I understand where my key target um, uh, talents are? What are they doing? You know, building personas, really trying to understand their behaviors a bit better and then working your strategy towards this by look at, for example, Stack Overflow. Everybody knows Stack Overflow. Have you mm -hmm. seen what happened with them now? Right. They changed a couple of things now and, and went more further down the line of branding and, and recruitment marketing to just understand based on their structure, they have certain communities where you can brand specifically into those communities and create this kind of um, awareness, which I think is something the way going forward, right? So we should, as, a, as, as, uh, as an organization that has a certain maturity in the hiring culture, and I think as a scale-up, you always hire. So if you have that established, 
then really understand it doesn't matter online or offline, it doesn't matter when and how, but you know, how do I understand the community? How can I give back to the community? And not always having in mind, I need to hire someone, right? But really trying to be giving back to the community, supporting certain initiatives, and then really stood out by creating learning momentums for people. And if you do that, a certain people will listen to you more, will respond to you much quicker, and um, really again, you know, say, oh, you know what? Even if I'm not looking, but I know Matthias helped me, you know, a year, year ago, I will definitely listen to him, right? Mm. And I think that is then something where it opens up a, a different level of recruiting. I always talk about talent advisory, but I think in the end of the day, it's really helping certain talents to build their careers and to become stronger. And if you have that reputation and that expertise, it will open you a lot of doors. And then it's not so much about how, how, how often have I posted my jobs on LinkedIn or wherever, yeah. because you will build those communities. They will always follow you around because of the way you have acted and interacted with them. And therefore it makes you that expert where a lot of people would then say in that specific area of tech recruiting or even commercial recruiting or whatever it is, hey, he is somebody who can explain and help people to build careers in that area. That's why I hired that person. Superb. But from a, and I'm guessing it's probably a plug for, for Beamery software as well, but like practically speaking, the nuts and bolts yep. of it on the day to day, how are you going about actually building this community in like what sort of where are you going to get them what platforms are you using to, to yeah. nurture them i'm guessing i know your answer but it'd be good if you could just expand a bit into the detail of that yeah yeah no sure 100 percent. so think a little about so we did i will work with examples right because it's you know gives uh, people practical um uh cases here so we just just recently um with a with a platform called hired um a coding challenge so we, we set up a coding challenge and said okay well you know, burst this out, praise this, you know, in the community, uh, advocate for it. And then with such a challenge created a healthy pipeline, people took the advantage, participated in it, got a little prize on top. And then you really could then nurture this and said, well, we had I don't know, 10,000, 15,000 engineers. I've seen that. And in the end, we got 40 or 50, which then helps me to say, hey, are you interested? Yes, I would love to explore the opportunity hey, actually want to stay in touch with a talent community, right? So you do certain actions, initiatives, which is a coding challenge, which is a webinar, which is a round table, which is, hey, this is a recent update, a blog post around it, where you make people excited about what you do. And then the BMW functionality comes in is, of course, when you're nurturing people, yeah. don't just be this a one-off, right? Because... You then make a monthly newsletter on it, say, hey, that's interesting stuff. Just make sure that you are aligned with the interests of your, your stakeholders. And then by nurturing this, you create your own job platform, you create your own job board, you create your own network around that. And that makes people click on that. And that will then decide us to say, these four or five people, we nurtured from those communities, right? So for us, and important now for the Berlin case is, what are the communities that we want to be part of? Where do we want to be present? If we know where we want to be present, then what kind of good conversations and learnings and items and what kind of things we can give back to the community where we're not just only do hiring, but literally doing the opportunity to be friendly and welcoming and also open. Because then the multiplicator effect comes in where people talk about it and say, ah, oh, a friend of a friend, actually, I know, that is somebody interesting, right? So, um, and then of course, work with the with the local heroes together. Um, and I'm not saying, you know, don't work with agencies. Yes, of course, also work with agencies together, right? And just figure out what is it that we can do and how can we then strategically make decisions around, for example, we have a senior engineer director role out at the minute. Um, great opportunity to diversify your engineer leadership team, right? Mm -hmm. And a lot of people are then always like, oh, yeah, and I look at the inbound and 80% male and, you know, the classic profile. And you'd be like, yeah, wait, wait a minute. 
you know, we shouldn't waste that opportunity. So let's just make everything that we possibly can to, you know, diversify that a bit more, right? And um, uh, what I learned over the years is um, you don't get so many opportunities to diversify leadership culture because you don't have like 15, 20, 30, 40, 100 roles out there every year, right? Yeah. So you need to be mindful around, oh, is it really about speed or is there an opportunity that has actually more impact because ideally, in my mind, the Berlin Tech Hub should be the most diverse Tech Hub that there is. That would be yeah. my ideal scenario, right? And um, to work with that, um, I try to make everything happen that, you know, um, comes in my way to, to actually strengthen that. Hmm. Absolutely fascinating. And it is the, it is 100% the, well, the present, but also the, the future of, of recruitment, that community building, that branding, the diversity and you can't you can't fake those things it's 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 something that cannot be you know um blagged it's it's real it's constant value and what you're saying about i mean it's basically like almost marketing um and you know it is isn't it and it's keeping in touch adding value all the time content whatever it may be um and eventually you get enough to convert to, to meet your hiring needs. And I do think that companies in Berlin and elsewhere that stick to the old ways, um, and it might be hard for you to believe that there are still companies holding on to the past. Um, they're starting to get left behind now, but I think now, it's, it's just going to be a disaster. A hundred percent. But then <clears throat> also, I think, you know, that change process, I think uh, I just talked to a friend of mine um, yesterday and I think, um, one of the things when, whenever you come in in a position like me, uh, we see that why they hire people like me is because something's not working, right? Or there is a problem, right? And it gets harder and harder these days to do those change management processes because in the end of the day, it's not a recruiting problem. It's a culture problem. It's a leadership problem. It's, uh, it's something that is um, underneath your actual challenge of just hiring or scaling hiring, right? And in recruitment, you always see this, that within recruitment, so many things will be uncovered around the current status quo of this company. And so most of the times you don't see that, right? And it starts also with decision-making, right? And if you then come in uh, and really turn this around, it's a lot, a lot of work, right? Yeah. And I think that's something where I would recommend to all of the younger teams no, not younger teams, that's the wrong term. All of the younger organizations, yeah, who are out there a year or two or three, already try to start to set up um, processes and, 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 and a certain foundation because that foundation will help you to scale easier and will shape a company where you don't have to change the process all over again because you realize after way too late time that, oh, the culture is not right or the people are not right, they cannot do that, et cetera, et cetera, right? So changing it in the very early stage will get will go, first of all, much faster, but at the second hand will also be much more successful because scaling, for me, it's more about the approach, not the problem. So scaling is fine. That's not the problem. The approach is what is so problematic and so painful for a lot of people because they don't focus around foundation and setups of teams or haven't even forgotten that with 300 openings, we have just three recruiters. Well, guess that's not going to fly, right? Uh, everybody mm. could tell you that. And yeah, I think that is something where, you know, if they have that mindset and understand very early on in which situation am I and what are the next steps, you know, then even interim people, you know, as I said in the beginning, people who are just, you know, coming in, have seen it quite often, could just advise people to come up with a solid strategy because that will give you 50% of all the pain away if you have a solid strategy mm. and plan in, in hand. But and you, don't, yeah, sorry. You know, sorry, to, sorry to cut in, but do you get much pushback when you, if you come into an organization or you have all these initiatives? Because it's like talent people, like we're judged on hires, right? So it's... And if you're implementing something and all the stuff you've mentioned, it takes time to get tangible results and people outside the function, they just want to see people signing. They want to know, you know, when someone's starting. So 
have you ever had much pushback with that? Have you had to sort of say to people, you know, it's going to take time? <laughs> I have pushback all the time. Yeah, I think um, <laughs> I, I, I cannot imagine where somebody said, oh, Matisse, you're here, you're three, uh, three million euros, let's go um, and see you later. Um, no, I think it's um, part of this is pretty much of when you look at organizations and no matter how big the pain is, right, you will have um, a lot of organizations that have short term business needs, right? So it's like, our roles are not filled. You know, um, I feel like um, um, the recruiters are not doing a good job because there's no transparency around it, et cetera, et cetera. And then when you fix that, uh, these uh, topics first, you can create some quick wins and you understand as a talent leader is like, where I can get my quick wins? What is taking longer? And then where should I start, right? Because as you said correctly, if um, I actually need to start from day one on building employer brand, But if people don't understand what employer brand means or believe that the marketing team can do employer brand as well, then this is already a structural problem, right? Um, and so um, for, for a lot of CEOs, that's very interesting, by the way, is the C-level needs talent people because they understand the pain. They understand we need to hire, we need to retain talent, right? We need to have a strategy in place. Now, with the buy-in of the C-level yeah, or the executives, this will help you to open a lot of doors if people don't buy into your plan. And I'm not saying you should always say, well, then my CEO comes along and we have that conversation with him. Uh, that's not what I'm suggesting, but definitely the buy-in will help you. The sponsorship will help you to get visibility in the organization to drive that change momentum. And I think that is then something which you can use But you need to make sure that in your first job, when you come in as a talent leader, what you need to do is you need to say, well, can I create that buy-in? Can I convince them of what I need to do? And if you're more experienced, you will understand and tell them right in the first session that you have with them, there will be people that would not like that change a lot. They will be against me. You need to have my back. I need to trust you that you help me out of that situation if I do what I need to do. And if you have that, then you create more impact faster. Absolutely. Is there, because I, I appreciate someone like yourself can probably get that buy-in because of what you've done in your record. Do you, there's the old adage that, you know, just go to the board with some data and you'll get them to agree with you. Do you, do you find that you, you have to you know, have a good amount of data to back your points up? Yes, 100%. You always need data. Um, and um, that's the pain part of it, right? Is a lot of times, even in my role, you would not imagine that 50% of my job is just pulling data and manipulate, manipulating in a data in a way that it makes sense to present to people to understand what I'm trying to say. Um, And that's, that's part of the success. So you need to understand that this is where the technology part comes in and, and, and the way to succeed here is if you understand how you get from technology the right data set and understand the data infrastructure where this is coming from, then you can pull your own reports and can build it and customize it in a way that you say this is a solid report, this is where this is coming from, this is how it, how it worked. And then maturity starts as a leader when you let your team know what they need to do in terms of getting accurate data. Yeah, because in the end of the day, the more accurate your data is, the better you make decisions that are in your favor and therefore you can really help organizations. But so, so many times is that data not accurate, right? And of course, you can argue, is it always accurate? Will it always be accurate? But if it's even accurate, like 85% or 90%, then this is already much better than in lots of organizations where I see, oh, you know what? You have here 15 stages, there are three stages, there are nine stages. And how do you make sure how your funnel looks like if everybody has their own kind of silo process that has yeah. nothing to do with data, uh, with, uh, with data accuracy, right? Absolutely superb. Wow. So... We are going to finish up soon. I'm, I'm sure our families would be like, well, what are you doing on a Friday night when uh, we're we talking about recruitment? It's just, it's just what we do. Um, 
so we've covered so much and like the depth of some of these topics um, have been amazing because I know it probably seems really normal to you, but there's a lot of talent teams in Berlin and beyond that need to basically shape up and, and adapt some, some modern practices and are faced with these big headcounts and they are just a bit overwhelmed really, especially in this, this market we, we find ourselves in. Um, I wanted just to finish with, um, if you could just give some advice to maybe someone who's not going into talent acquisition, but say in a talent team already, they could be a lead um, or part of an organization where they're struggling to hire. Um, more work is going into their hiring and less results are coming out. Almost if you came in sort of as an advisor, as like in a con consultant capacity, is there any sort of couple of bits of advice that, that you would you would say to them just to as like an audit of, of, of what they need to do potentially? Yeah, um, good question. I think uh, one of the things that I've learned is um, always keep an open mind um, and um, look at um, if people are, are hearing this, look at design thinking um, and the discovery process of products. Um, I feel like our minds, and that's why where our biases starts, we look at problems and autom automatically jump to solutions. Um, in your environment that you're in at the moment with that problem that you have, um, you probably, um, I would say, are already biased, right? And you don't get the real answer um, and you probably you know, are biased yourself and you cannot really understand what's going on. So one of the things to understand what the root cause of this problem is, I think, first of all, look at the data and really make a good look into that. That will help you to understand, is it a top funnel, mid funnel, end funnel problem? Yeah. And then by data, I mean also in context to KPIs um, and the right KPIs and also understand how they are set up, right? I can just tell you this without, you know, exploring this further, but in my career, I've probably seen 10 to 15 different definitions of time to hire. Yeah. So yeah. you need to be careful of like, what is this that I'm looking at? Once you have done that, I think you need to talk to all of the people that are involved, right? Separately. And by that, I mean, like, you know, ask similar questions. What do you feel about that? What, what's going on here? What's, you know, happening there? What I see with the problem that you described, it's a decision-making problem. It's a decision-making problem of not knowing what good looks like and how do we understand based on if candidates didn't make it after a certain stage, what is it that we need to iterate on to then, when we interview new candidates, to look at different things in order to succeed? So remember that example that I said with this um, interim lead that I had from Google. This is the funnel. Look at the funnel. Look at the conversion rates. And then try to understand where are we, where are we struggling, where I'm losing a lot of candidates, why do I lose them, and what can I do to ensure that I don't lose them the next time. Because the worst, the, the worst problem that you have is you put too much, have too much interviews, you have great candidates, and nobody understands that right? Because they cannot assess, they don't have a consistency there. Maybe there's even a bias. There maybe is a coaching needed, an interview training, right? I think so and so many times, these are the core problems. And um, in the end of the day, ideally, you want to have like two or three candidates in the final round to say, what do I get from the ones that I have, right? And it could be different things, yeah? Um, and um, I, I really encourage people to do that, to have that discovery mode, to have those conversations, but then really iterate and talk to your people. Yeah. If you don't see the your hire manager for the role every week, you have a problem. You know, yeah. there, there, something is broken. Right. Um, and uh, maybe last sentence uh, to that is make sure that people understand that ideally 20% of your time should be recruiting when you're in organizations like mine or scaling organizations. Hire managers need to understand, they need to make time for recruitment, and if they have a short period of time, just re-engineer this and say, okay, you have two hours that you put in per week. We need to hire 15 people in two, we uh, two months. With your two hours, not going to fly. Here's the, uh, here's the data. And, um, and, and then let's see how that, <laughs> how that um, not escalates, but literally how that starts people thinking about, oh, okay, you know, and then look at, for example, the time between stages and say, 
well, it's obvious that in this stage, it takes three weeks. Is this good? <laughs> you know? So um, I think these are things that I would do. And then it gives you a lot of uh, understanding of like, okay, what is it that we can do? And last sentence, relationship building and stakeholder management is the key oh, yeah. to the success, right? A lot of people underestimate that because this is about how do you lead leaders? I have clearly seen that you have sometimes leaders that needs clear guidance and actions on how to do things and leading leaders You need to have a certain maturity yourself, right? And um, if you haven't done that, then this is rather challenging, right? Because then it becomes this power play approach. Because if you work with a head of, if you work with a VP, yes, and you are probably just a senior individual contributor or mid-level, there is this power play momentum, right? But bring this away from opinions and emotions and base this uh, back with facts, Because those people are used to facts and understand and make decisions based on facts. Otherwise, they wouldn't be in that position. So really, really use that and make that happen in order to succeed. Fantastic. Well, there you go. Talent acquisition completed. That is, that is uh, all you need to know. Um, well, we will finish there. I, really, I could have continued this on for, for a long time because... There's so much to to what you do and uh, to what to what I do as well. Uh, so many different dimensions, and I think as well for people that are listening who aren't used to such a stiff, hard, you know, hiring market. Your insights and uh, the way you've kind of laid things out and the stuff you've shared is going to be so so valuable to to so many people. I know that for sure. Uh, people will be hanging off your every word trying to get as much information as possible. So I just want to say thank you so much for your time. I know it's late on a Friday. I'm going to allow you to, to get off now. Thank you so much for listening to the Building Our World podcast. Every view, stream and download is massively appreciated. If you're new here, then please go back through the catalogue. There's some great gems from some of the brightest and the best in Berlin tech. And if you really like what you hear, then please do hit that follow and subscribe button. That's it for now. But until next time, goodbye.